so that the stories that I'm going to tell you have uh, the uh, temporality, the scale of evolutionary time, the temporality of face-to-face -face time, and the temporality of, for lack of a better term, I call historical time, the time of nation building, uh, labor migration, transitions in modes of subsistence, the kinds of medium dure times that seem to be the major subject matter of that genre of narrative we call history. So you will find, find my stories moving between geological evolutionary time, face-to-face -face time, historical time, and occasionally uh, making forays into the tiny scales of molecular time. But I'm interested in the scale making of temporalities and their kind of uh, co their co co temporality of these various scales in relation to telling dog stories. So first, let me begin with some evolution stories. I don't think that's where I am in my notes, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, the um, mode of pathology that I described a minute ago, that humanist technophiliac narcissism, is particularly prevalent in the older and conventional stories of the evolution of dogs from their ancestor canid species, uh, particularly wolves. It takes the form of uh, early uh, Neolithic man, uh, takes wolf puppies, brings them in from the cold, uh, domesticates them, and turns them to his intentions. And indeed, the first domesticated animal is in many ways one of the first serious acts of man, the toolmaker. And indeed, realizing himself in living flesh is the forecast of Uncle Mouse and other genetic, genetically engineered forms familiar to us in biotechnology as intentionality is realized in the flesh and becomes entirely the medium of, of man's intentions, even to the extent of becoming ownable property in a commodity circulation network. Uh, all of the agency is on the side of humanity. All of the materiality is on the side of animality. All of the realization of intention is from mind to body. And domesticated animals, from the deep ecologist's point of view, indeed, are the fall from grace, the expulsion from the garden. And dogs, from the point of view of deep ecologists, just speak to one and you'll find this to be a clear empirical truth. Dogs, from the point of, point of view of deep ecologists, are truly vermin. They are a violation of wildness. They are evidence of the decay of, of the coming technological apocalypse. They are the sign of nature um, in decay. They are, they, dogs are um, the evidence of the depravity of, of, of man uh, in this mind-body dialectic toward death. Now, the notion that dogs are man's invention is one of those fantastic illusions uh, that does not bear up under the scrutiny of what I will uh, kindly of call evidence. <laughs> that indeed occasionally looking for something along the lines of evidence might bear on some of these matters. Uh, and indeed, some of my uh, best friends and worst enemies, the molecular biologists, uh, also some uh, comparative fossil anatomists and no small number of uh, archaeologists, paleo paleoanthropologists and archaeologists, have collectively put together uh, a rather evidence-rich re-narrativization of the emergence um, of these uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, Dog wannabe, you know, wolf, uh, dog wannabe wolves. Uh, you know what happens uh, when the uh, dog wannabe wolves make the move. The the most evidence-rich accounts of dog evolution make the first moves toward close cohabitation a kind of opportunistic uh, subsistence strategy on the part of the um, on the part of wolves, the dog wannabe wolves, who make use of wasteful hominid practices and become perhaps the first sanitary engineers in our species history. Pigs also vie for the honor. Although I won't tell the story of pig domestication here, uh, it actually follows some of the same lines. Hominids are very wasteful and they leave a lot of calories around that a rather brave animal might make use of. So that probably the initiating action in the story of domestication is from the side of the animals to make use of a calorie bonanza that makes it worthwhile to uh, deal with this really very dangerous bipedal social hominid. The other large-bodied social opportunistic mammals, the, the dog wannabe wolves, uh, undergo a very interesting biobehavioral, partially genetically assimilated series of changes that have some very subtle but very important effects on the overall organization of a life way that sets into motion an obligatory symbiosis from the point of view of the dog wannabe wolves um, and the ground for which is probably um, a, uh, a serious uh, food opportunity. What happens to the dog wannabe wolves 
uh, is subtle, but it involves various details of developmental timing, such, that, such as the window of opportunity for cross-species bonding is considerably longer in dogs than it is in wolves. Uh, the flight Fright, uh, the fight-flight distance is reduced. Uh, various kinds of fearful actions that are absolutely crucial for the survival of a wild species are modulated. The uh, various neuronal and hormonal cocktails that determine subtleties of interaction are modulated in such a way as to permit cohabiting uh, a much more closely in social space. Uh, undoubtedly, there are human agencies in this story as well as these uh, on their way to being dogs organisms perform a number of more or less accidentally useful functions for human communities, including alert barking, uh, including scent, uh, various kinds of scents, marking and scent uh, perception. Um, there are plenty of opportunities for human agency to put uh, these uh, now um, modestly cooperative cohabiting entities to work for human purposes. But the notion that agency and domestication is somehow the realization of mental intention in animal flesh is a fantasy uh, that misstates the uh, multiple agencies and multiple directions of agency over a very long story that is several tens of thousands of years old. Uh, the best molecular and archaeological evidence puts it somewhere between 15 and 50,000 years that dogs and human beings have cohabited on a global, uh, pretty close to a global basis. The spread of dogs with humans from their uh, source of origin, which seems most likely to have been East Asia, has been very, very fast. Um, these are organisms that found each other to each other's advantage over a very long period of time and in many, many sorts of activities. Everything from an affectional economy, uh, the, the pet relationship, which is probably very ancient, various kinds of working relationships, everything from the uh, spit-turning dogs that we're familiar with in pre-19th century Europe, uh, the uh, herding dogs, the guard dogs, the war dogs, uh, versions of all of these. There is no more any such thing as the dog than there is the human. All of these relationships are uh, irreducibly specific, irreducibly historical, irreducibly involve multiple agency and heterogeneous ontologies. Um, to tell the story of humanity is to tell the story of multiple co-constitutive symbioses, some of, them, some of them in the form of diseases. For example, a great deal of human history can be told through the multi-species history of diseases like the flu, some of them in terms of that kind of capturing of genomes that almost certainly uh, are part of the development of complex mammalian uh, immune systems that have allowed organisms such as ourselves to survive with each other and, uh, and with other species in novel ways. Uh, the kind of capturing of, ge of genetic possibility as well as biobehavioral change that is only very lightly genetically assimilated and still actually highly malleable. These are the normal stories of becoming human. They are the stories of emergent opportunity. They are the story of nature cultures, a single word. Part of my goal in narrating in this way is to calm the fears of my friends in this uh, curious enemy they call biological determinism and to make us think more richly about the mixing of agencies and the mixing of ontologies and the distributed kinds of, of um, mental and physical life that go on in constituting a livable life, which is always a multi-species and co-constitutive life. Okay. Now, this way of telling the history of domestication redoes uh, the history of technology. It sets up a different narrative pattern for thinking about the history of technology and thinking about the relationships of uh, matter and mind. Okay. That clearly is a, is a kind of, of motivation on my part for telling the story that way. I also think it happens to be somewhat truer. Now there's another part of this story that actually turns to the developmental biology of the organisms in question. And here I turn to uh, a, a relatively recent um, convergence in, um, in biological thinking called ecological developmental biology. It's a synthetic interdisciplinarity that is made possible in biology these days by the techniques of molecular biology that allows answers to questions that were technically unmanageable before the very recent past. It allows folks to de design um, experimental systems for asking the kinds of questions like, can normal mental and, and a physiological structure develop in an organism absent interaction with other organisms at key developmental times? The answer turns out to be, surprise, no. 